9. I want to begin reading. Um, we've been studying the mysteries in our Bible study, and uh, this one just, it, you know, it stayed with me, and I feel like it, uh, I, hope you get a, I hope you get something out of it. In verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now verse 10, uh, the mystery of his will has to do with God's eternal purpose or the heavens and the earth. And there are two things. There is heaven, which are in heaven, and which are on earth. There's a division there. And that's one reason why we, we stress so much in the scriptures uh, our, our preaching and teaching about right division. And it's not that we make divisions in the Bible. We just recognize the divisions that's already there, that God put there. And so I want to talk about the mystery of his will just for uh, a while. And, uh, you know, I usually say, what do I usually say? A few minutes? Okay, that's good enough. But the mystery of his will. Well, the mystery of his will is in verse 10. And the mystery of his will has to do with the heavenly ministry of Christ. And there's an earthly ministry of Christ. And so we'll look at both ministries uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll see there's a difference. Just like there's a difference in between heaven and a difference on the earth. And so we want to start there. So I want to look at Christ... On earth. Now Paul, uh, Robbie read the verse there in first, uh, Second Corinthians. And he said, uh, no, no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. And you could add, but you, he didn't, but after the flesh. We don't know Christ after the flesh today. And no more than you ought to know each other after the flesh as members of the body of Christ. But what I want you to see is Christ. Turn, turn back with me and notice uh, you'll find in Romans and chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And notice what he says here in verse 8. You ought to have this verse underlined in your Bible. It ought to be a mark beside of it. Notice what he said in verse 8, Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now you'll notice in verse 9 that the Gentiles, well, I know the circumcision that he was confirming promises was a minister of the circumcision is not Gentiles. Right? <clears throat> Come over to chapter 9. Look in Romans chapter 9. And notice what Paul said in verse 3. Romans 9 verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are who? Israelites. Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers? And of whom, those that the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless it forever, amen. 
then the fathers, that's who he came. He's confirming the promises made unto the fathers. And the fathers, who are they? <coughs> well, there's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They're the fathers. Now look at, uh, let's try something else after the flesh. Come back with me to Matthew. Look in Matthew chapter 15. We find out that they are Israelites. Uh, notice in Matthew 15. All right, look what he says. Here's a woman that comes to him. Verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now she's talking to the Lord, and she has a legitimate complaint. She has a problem she can't do nothing with. She comes to the Lord. He's out there healing, see, and she's seeing all of this. Look what he says. Verse 23, but he answered her, not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of who? Israel. Israel. Well, who was Jesus Christ a minister to? The circumcision. Confirming the promises made unto the fathers. Well, what promises was made unto the fathers? Well, one of them was Abraham. And God had promised him land. And he said, as far as your eye can see, your seed would inherit the land. He also promised a father. You know who that father was? David. And he promised him that of the seed of his law, they would be sitting on the throne. Come to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And notice Jesus Christ, verse 1. The book of the generations of Jesus Christ. The son of who? David, and the son of Abraham. There's the throne of David, the land that was promised to that kingdom. It has to do with the kingdom. Look with me and come back to Matthew chapter 10. Uh, I, well, go to 4. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus Christ is out preaching. Verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's the king and he's preaching about a kingdom, a literal visible kingdom on this earth. And you'll find in Deuteronomy, let's just go back there, Deuteronomy chapter 11. I believe it is Deuteronomy chapter 11. And this is what Moses had prophesied. Notice in verse 11. The land, whether ye go to possess it, uh, uh, is a land of hills, valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. A land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it. From the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Talking about the land. Verse 11 and 12. Look over in verse 21. That your days may be multiplied. And the days of your children in the land. Which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. There's the kingdom there. Promise them a kingdom. Look in chapter 10. I mean uh, chapter 11. Uh, no, let me, 12, verse 10. Look what he said in verse 10, chapter 12. But when ye go over to Jordan, dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit. And when he giveth you rest 
from all your enemies round about so that ye dwell in safety. There's the peace. There's the kingdom. They're always looking for that time when they'll be saved from their enemies. And in fact, look in Luke and go to the book of Luke. And notice what he says in Luke. Jesus Christ is born. And what do they do? They prophesy about him. Notice he says in Luke chapter 2, I believe it is. Let me get there. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Luke chapter 1 first. Look in Luke 1. Uh, <clears throat> verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and, he, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Then the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob. Now Jacob's was, name was changed to Israel. He's going to reign over Israel for how long? Forever. And his kingdom, there shall be no end. It's going to just keep going. Look over in chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, notice in verse 28. Ye are they which have continued with me in my te temptations. Talking to the twelve. He said, and I appoint unto you a what? Kingdom. As my father hath appointed unto me. That ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit upon thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now folks, there ain't no doubt about it. There's a land, a promise. He's confirming the promises made unto the fathers. He said to that woman over there in Matthew 15, I didn't go ahead and finish it, but I'll just tell you, finally he said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The earthly ministry of Jesus Christ was not to people like you and me, not to Gentiles. Uh, that was not in the covenants of promise. Jesus Christ came to Israel under his own. In John he said he came unto his own and his own received him not. And folks, they rejected the Son of God and then he had 12 disciples. In fact, look with me back in Matthew. In Matthew, and notice what he says to them in verse, uh, <clears throat> in chapter 21. In chapter 21. And by the way, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 5 and look at something and compare this with uh, Matthew in Isaiah 5. Notice in Isaiah chapter 5, and you'll get that in one hand. Notice in, uh, here in Matthew 21, verse 33. Here another parable. Now he's talking to the Sadducees. He's talking to some people. Notice what he said. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it around about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to the husbandman and went into a far country. And when the time of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman and they, that they might receive the fruits of it. Come on down to verse 37. But last of all that he sent unto them his son, saying, They'll reverence my son. In verse 39, they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard. Now folks, who is this? Look in Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah chapter 5, and notice what he says in verse 1. Now will I sing unto my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it 
uh, he fenced it. He gathered out of the stones thereof, planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tire in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Verse 4, oh, well, verse 3. Now, O inhabitants of who? Jerusalem and Jew, men of Judah, judge, I pray unto you, betwixt me and my vineyard. For what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when he looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. Come down to verse 7. Well, he said, or verse 6, he said, I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. That's what's over there now. I will also command the clouds and that they rain no rain upon it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is who? The house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. And then I just want, I wanted you to see that vineyard. It's the house of Israel. It's over there in the land of Palestine. That's where the vineyard of the Lord is. That's the land that God's eyes is never off of. He knows what's going to happen. And I know what's going to happen. I know that one day the King of Kings is coming back to this earth. I know the one day he will establish a kingdom on this earth. I know he will put his enemies under his footstool. I know he will. He will win the battle. You can rest assured. You can have confidence in it. You put your confidence in the Lord. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You put your confidence in the Bible. Don't put your confidence in a man. Don't put your confidence in a system. Put your confidence in the Lord. His word will come to pass. He's going to set up a kingdom on this earth and it's going to be like heaven on earth and Israel will someday dwell in peace. Well, she's not in peace today. They're in turmoil. And there's briars and brambles growing up in the land of Israel today that, and I believe it has to do with people but anyway, that over there, it's destitute. But God has a purpose for this earth. And in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He's going to sum up the thing and heaven and earth will be under Christ's domain. And Satan and all of the lost that follow Him the children of wrath, as Paul calls them, will be put down and cast into a lake of fire and you don't want that. Trust me, you don't want that. I want to be in the other group, don't you? Now look, so Christ comes. In fact, he of the seed of David, according to the flesh, look at Christ. Come over to, uh, and by the way, notice he says there in chapter 21, all the way down. Look what he said to these people in verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, not nations, a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Look with me in Luke, again in chapter 12. Who, who is this nation? This nation, notice in chapter 12, verse 32. I'm going to read verse 31. He says, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the what? There's the nation. Now I like the next verse. Sell that you have. People want to apply their time period to religion today, but they won't do what he says in verse 33, sell that what you have. Do you realize that the twelve sold their houses and their land and everything in Acts 2, 3, 4, and 5 and brought the money to the apostles and laid it down at their feet? Why? They are expecting that kingdom to come. They are expecting the king to return. Their ministry has to do with the nation Israel on this earth. And that is not what God's doing today. God today, in fact, look in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'm just, these verses is coming to mind, so I'm just going to read it. I don't have no, nothing up here wrote down. It's just, but look in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, notice how Peter preaches about Christ. He said in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. They're preaching about that throne. They're preaching the resurrection, but it ain't the resurrection that Paul preached. Notice something else. Turn over and look in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look about Paul. Paul preached Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, notice in verse, well, uh, 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David, just like Peter, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Paul, Peter preached that he's raised from the dead to sit on the throne. Peter's preaching about that kingdom that Jesus preached. Jesus told him five days before his resurrection, he told him when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then the end shall come. Five days later, he tells them to go and, and preach the gospel to the world. Folks, there was no change in the gospel that Christ preached and the gospel that Peter and the twelve preached. They're preaching about a kingdom. They're preaching about have Israel being saved from their enemies and dwelling in safety, heaven on earth a land flowing with milk and honey. It's about a kingdom. Well, you ain't never seen the like of that in your lifetime. Have you? It's coming in the future. So that's the whole earthly ministry of Christ after the flesh to the nation Israel, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Training 12 men to go out and offer the kingdom after his resurrection to the nation Israel. Why is it so important to get Israel? Because according to prophecy, Israel was to be saved. Then Israel will go out to the Gentiles and evangelize the Gentiles and they'll come to the light of Israel. That's the prophecy program that's concerning the earth but God started something new when Israel blasphemed against the spirit of God 
And when rejected the message of the twelve, God had every right to stand up and judge Christ as enemies and pour out and speak to this world in his wrath. He'd done everything that he had done. He sent John the Baptist, one of the greatest prophets, and the prophets came, and Israel would not repent. And he sent his son into the world, and they said, we'll not have this man to rule over us. And finally the Holy Spirit sent the twelve, and they go and they're preaching the kingdom, and they're preaching the resurrection of Christ, their king, their Messiah, their prince and they rejected that God had every right to just wipe everything out and he could he already did it one time but he didn't he had a secret that he hadn't told nobody and that secret was he'd already revealed how he was going to do it with the earth. <coughs> but nobody knew about that of the heavens until Paul. So he saves the rebellion and uh, leader, the, uh, the re leader of the rebellion and stops it. And Paul began to suffer. So he goes with a message and it's a secret. God is not dealing in prophecy now. There are no signs today because the uh, times of the signs is not today. There's nothing. Paul lays out what you're to look for. The trends of the Evil time is coming upon us. And they're here. Time is slowly but surely running out. I want you to look at some things. Look at Paul said you remember now. Of the seed of David. How that Christ was raised. Turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And notice this in Paul's mentioned in the resurrection, Romans chapter 4. I'm just going to jump in. He's talking about Abraham. Verse 20, he staggered not at the promises of God, the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. You know, you, you ought to ask yourself, am I really fully persuaded that whatever God promised me, he's going to perform it? I can honestly say I am. And you? He said in verse 22, And therefore it, Abraham's faith, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone, but that it was imputed to him, but, that, uh, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, the righteousness of Christ. Imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Paul preached that Jesus Christ died for all your sins. I mean all of them folks. Your past, present, future he went to the cross. He died for all of them. And they were buried, put out of God's sight. And God raised him up 
for your justification. In other words, God the Father can be just and right by giving you eternal life. Why? Why? Your sins has been paid for. Your offensive to Him has been removed and now God can accept you. Now what do you need? You need to accept Jesus Christ and believe He did it for you. You see a lot of people know the historical facts of the gospel. There's religions all over the world that talk about the death, the resurrection, the burial, the resurrection. But people know the facts. But when has it become the gospel of your salvation? We talk about the world being saved, but when did it become the gospel, the good news for you? When did you get lost and believe the gospel for your lost condition? And trust Him. Your sins is not the problem. Your unbelief. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. So Paul preached the resurrection and he said, keep that in mind. Paul preached and this mystery of back in Ephesians now. Look at this thing. He said in verse 11. In verse 10 you have the mystery of his will. You have which he had purposed in himself. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. We done discussed the earth. He's going to do that with Israel. And they're going to rule over the nations. They're, not, they're going to be the head, not the tail. They're going to be the judge in the twelve. The twelve will be judging Israel and the twelve tribes and each tribe will have a Gentile territory of this earth and they'll be the leaders of that territory and the kings of the nations of the Gentiles on this earth, they're going up to worship the king of kings every year. Mark her down. And there'll be no curse on the earth. Well, how's he going to get that into heaven? He had a secret. And the body of Christ is the central position, the focal point of this mystery. God today saving people, men, women, boys and girls, and putting them into a body of believers to rule in the heavens out there. That's the mystery of his will. Look what he says there. And, uh, in heaven and earth which are even in him. Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him. Who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God Almighty is going to use the body of Christ that's going to, in fact, while you're there in chapter uh, 1, look in verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us word who believe? There's the key word. It's who believe. He said there, uh, us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all. Look in chapter 2. He said in verse 10, uh, I'm going to read verse 8. For uh, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath for ordained that we should walk in them. Look at verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together. Where? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then we look at Christ. Turn to Colossians. In Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Notice what he said in verse 16. A reference to Christ. For by him uh, were all things created in heaven and in the earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things was created by him and for him. Notice it's all things in heaven and earth. Then heaven has thrones, they have principalities, they have dominions up there in the heavens. I'll notice in, to go on, verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the pre preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Folks, he's the head of the body. He's building the body. That body's called a building. Look in chapter 2 again. Notice what he says in, uh, uh, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. And notice in verse 21. He said, talking about uh, the twelve, he, I mean the uh, Paul and the apostles, and are built upon the foundation, verse 20, of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. He's building a building. He's building a spirit temple. It's made up of sinners, Gentile sinners, Jew sinners. It's made up of people that recognize they're lost, they've never been saved, and they're going to hell and they turn to Christ and they accept Him and trust Him that He paid everything for them and they're saved by God's grace. You're put into that building. It's a building. It's a spiritual building. If you ain't in that church, when Jesus Christ comes back, you're not going. I don't care if you in, got your name on every church roll in Yagin County, Iredale County, or North Carolina. And I don't care if you've been baptized or your skin's wrinkled up. I mean, let me tell you, it's not about that. It's about what Jesus Christ did for you and you trust in that for your salvation. What is your salvation? It's eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And folks, we know Him as the head. We know Him as the Lord of glory. We know Him as our Savior, the one that died, the one that has, we're, we're, we have forgiveness of sins through His blood. We're, we're set apart in the body of Christ. We're sealed under the day of redemption. We have eternal security and other people in other dispensations, they didn't have it. You have a heavenly position out there, a seat of authority, every member. And you'll reign in the heavens. Now, this is my last verse. Now, I ain't lying to you. I want you to look with me in Revelation.
I might read more than one. I want you to look at something in verse 7. And this is right in the middle of the tribulation. The Bible said there was war in heaven. Chapter 12 verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not. Neither was their place. There's their seat. Their place found any more in heaven. So Satan and his angels all had seats, places in the heavens. Verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. How does he deceive the whole world? Through religion. Don't let religions of this world and the denominational systems blind your eyes. There's only one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. You can't get to heaven other than by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. But look what he says. Deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Come down to verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that what? Now who you reckon that's going to be? <coughs> and if you don't know, I've just wasted the last 15 minutes. He's cleaned the heavens out. But there's somebody rejoicing that's going to dwell in them. Am I right or wrong? Well, I don't know who that would be unless it's the body of Christ. Our rejoicing over it will be seated in heavenly places. And as far as God's concerned, we're already there. We have an inheritance. If you're saved. If you're not saved. If you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Believing that he died for all your sins. Then why don't you do it now? Now I'm going to tell you something. You don't have to get up. You don't have to go nowhere. This is no altar up here. This is a platform that they elevated up so you could see me and I could see you. And I can see every one of you. I look at you when I'm preaching. I know who's asleep and who's not. I know who's naughty and who ain't. I can see you. So this is no altar. The altar was at Calvary. There's where God offered a sacrifice in your behalf. There's where God judged and poured His wrath out on His Son for you. Believe it, receive it, God will give you eternal life. And you can do that right where you're sitting right now. Right now you can trust Christ. And he'll give you eternal life. Let's pray.